Um, over the last few weeks, we've been in a series called Accepted. And uh, who's been enjoying the series? Anybody? Yeah, it's been great. I've, I've loved it. I love talking about worship. Worship is something that I've done for, uh, man, since I was 13 years old. Learning how to strum the guitar, worship has been an integral part of my life. Integral. Very, very important. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about worship that God accepts. The idea that God accepts and rejects. And that's important. And uh, in, the last, in these last two weeks, we've learned that worship is absolutely only for God. Right? The first week we talked about that. Worship is absolutely only for God. He's a jealous God. He does not want to share his glory with us. We don't get any of it. And then last week we talked about how um, there are two kinds of worship. There is a worship that is accepted and rejected based on obedience or disobedience. Meaning that we don't get just to slap a label of worship on anything that we care for and then give it to God and he's just going to take that. In fact, it's quite the opposite. He says, do it this way, and I'll accept it. Do what I asked you, and won't you be accepted, right? And so this week I thought, you know, well, and it's been kind of hard. These, these last two weeks have been pretty hard, right? It's like we're being told, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. No one likes that message. The problem is we're doing it wrong, <laughs> right? And we need to, we need to hear this. What we want on, on when we come together and when you live your life, you want the offering of yourself to be accepted. But there are things that we do, whether we've uh, been taught them or where, whether we've adopted them, that rob God of his glory and make the offering that we're giving him tainted with ourself. And what ends up happening is we don't experience what we're supposed to experience. We feel dry and, and lonely in the desert. How do we know that our worship is being accepted? How do we know that? Jesus talked about in our key verse in John, right, that, that the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? How will we know if we're doing it right? What will be the fire, right, when it happened with Elijah? What will be the fire that comes down and accepts and consumes our sacrifice? How will we know that that's happening? And so that's, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. If you're taking notes, hopefully you got a bulletin. If not, maybe one of the ushers can give you one. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Here's the big idea for today. Accepted worship always leads to transformation. Accepted worship always leads to transformation. Uh, what do I mean by that? That means that there's something that happens when we come into the presence of God. There is something that happens that happens nowhere else. When you come into the very presence of God, you cannot stay the same. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's not, uh, we talked about, it's not about what we get out of worship, right? Worship isn't getting. We give worship. But worship is about who you become. So it's not about what I get in worship. It's about who I become in worship. And as I've, as I've reflected on the scriptures, and there's many of them that talk about this, um, some of which we'll read today, when people found themselves in the presence of God, they didn't walk away the same person. I'm enamored by this. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but when water is introduced to a certain frequency, it changes its shape. It's kind of crazy looking, right? That's in real time. It's not slowed down. At 24 hertz, this will happen. You go to 25, it makes it look like the water's moving down. If you go to 23 hertz, it makes it look like the water's coming back up. But what I see here is, is water is being impacted, is being changed by something I can't. If you have your Bibles today, 
I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. That's in the Old Testament. And we're going we're gonna to look at the story of Isaiah. He was a prophet, a Hebrew prophet for the Lord. And God would speak to Isaiah, and then Isaiah would then speak to the people of Judah. And in chapter 6 of Isaiah, um, Uzziah, who was king, uh, was dead, and the throne was empty. And, uh, and, and Isaiah turns to the Lord for help. So basically, there's a vacancy. We got real enemies. There's stuff going on. Lord, Lord, I need your help. You ever come to God with your, with your problems, right? Lord, I need your help. We just sang that song, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. There's an obvious dependence upon God. There you go. Thank you for the lights. So Isaiah chapter 6, read with me. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook, and the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. For I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken up with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This is a beautiful, beautiful, really cool picture that God gave to Isaiah. And Isaiah writes down so that we today can get a glimpse of this. It's amazing. We're talking about how accepted worship always leads to transformation. Isaiah turns to the Lord for help because Uzziah is dead, right? Um, he had rebelled. He had rebelled against God and ended up dying a leper. It's pretty bad. It's tragic. It's sad, actually. And even though for, it was like a 52 years, Uzziah had led uh, Judah in a program of peace and prosperity. But Isaiah realized that, that though the, un, the nation uh, had prospered materially, spiritually, it was in some big trouble. Spiritually, there was a problem. The economic growth and temporary peace were just a veneer. It was a covering of a nation with a wicked heart. And from this passage, you know, I want to point out a few things that tra transform us in worship. Can I do that? So accepted worship always leads to transformation. Always. And when we worship God, when you are truly worshiping God, the first thing I note is God's glory takes our full attention. God's glory takes our full attention. Isaiah thought, um, you know, he thought he was coming to God for, with a problem, right? He thought he was coming to God with a problem, but what he got, he wasn't ready for it. He was not ready. He saw God on his throne, something nobody's seeing. Nobody gets these visions. Lord, give me a word so we can figure this out, you know, boots on the ground. What are we supposed to do? Instead, he sees God in all of his glory sitting on his throne. He's not like, yeah, okay, cool. You got fire and pyrotechnics and angels. That, what, about, what about my problem? D did you get my email? Like, I kind of asked you about something. No, everything stops. Everything stops. And the glory of the Lord takes full attention. There is no circumstance that can stand and compete with the glory of God in his presence. And a lot of times we come and we got real issues. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying God doesn't care about your problems. He does. We all got real issues. We all got, you know, uh, um, lives to live and bills to pay. But sometimes we come into God's presence or we live our life always on the uh, asking God, asking God, asking God, asking God, asking God that we do not even recognize his glory. And what happened with Isaiah is he, 
He comes to ask God for something and what opens up stops him in his tracks. And he's looking, he's seeing this and, and nothing else matters. That's a beautiful place to be. Faced with the glory of God. And it's not that my issues don't matter. They're just not that important at the moment. When I acknowledge that God's glory takes my full attention. You know. How many of us just come to God because we want something? Think about that. Think about how many times your prayers are, God, I love you. God, I need you. God, I, you know, I just want to be with you. Or is it, God, I need you to do this. God, I'm in a, I'm in a bind. God, I need your help. God, you got to deliver me. God. It's like I always know when my boys want something, right? Because they do this weird smile, right? It's like an over-the-top cheesy grin. Hey, Dad. Right? I always know when they want something. And so it's like, okay, what, what do you want? Right? You're going to ask for something. But when you see, but you see, when we come into the presence of God, his glory is paralyzing. It takes the focus of the eye. Nothing else can get in the way. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. Two that covered their face, two that covered their feet, two that they flew with. And they called to one another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. I mean, are you getting a mental picture? Can you imagine this, right? And even our imagination doesn't even compare to Isaiah actually seeing this. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the threshold shook. The recognition of his glory takes, takes our full attention. So you cannot come into it with this casual experience or this casual uh, uh, just strolling through it and oh, that's nice. No. When you are experiencing the glory of the Lord, it takes the stage. It takes everything. It takes it. Doesn't ask for it. It takes it. It has, everything else has no choice. And Isaiah is seeing something amazing. It says that he saw the seraphim, the ones with the six wings, and they're, they're called the fiery ones. They're literally on fire, right? I mean, I'd be freaking out just at that. That is cool. Seeing this throne room of God and all of his glory and his, his robe filling the train of the temple. And they're, they're circling around him and there's this song, there's this, this chant, there's this saying that's going on. The first thing that transforms us when you're worshiping right is God's glory takes all of our attention. The issue is no longer about you. Not that your issues don't matter, but it's the glory of God. I'm coming into the presence of God and his glory takes it all. And if we're smart, we won't try to touch it. It says the whole earth is full of his glory. His glory is all over. His glory, think about this. The, the whole earth is full of his glory. That includes my situation. That includes my problem. That includes my day-to-day -day tasks. That includes my marriage and my relationship with my kids, my, my co-workers, where I work. It... God's glory fills the whole earth. And I get this, I, I, this picture of Isaiah really worried and concerned about Judah, really worried about this throne and the real threats. And then what, he, what he gets to see is that, hey, God's on his throne. He's still there where he's always been. And you're focused on the wrong thing. It's his glory. His glory. And his glory fills this whole place. It's above my situation, transcends my dilemma. Worship that leads to transformation happens when God's glory gets our full attention. When, when we're no longer fixated on, on us, me, God, fix, help, but God, 
God, your glory is so amazing. God, you are so powerful. God, the full recognition of his glory. Transformation begins there. And Isaiah, exper- Isaiah experiences this, and, and immediately he's confronted not with a, his earthly circumstance. He's not reminded, yeah, but the king, yeah, but this. No, he says, woe, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. See, when you're worshiping God, when you're truly worshiping God, God's glory reveals our sin and we repent. God's glory reveals our sin and we repent. Isaiah's freaking out right now, okay? He, and rightfully so, because God's glory is so great, right? That Isaiah knows, he knows instinctively like, whoa, I should not be seeing this. I am not worthy to, to observe this. There is nothing great about me. In fact, I know I, it is clear in this moment why I don't get to be here. Why I don't get to be here. He is aware of his deficiency of holiness immediately. A true encounter with God and his holiness always makes us realize our own sinfulness and failure. And there's multiple examples of this in the scripture, but here's a couple. Uh, Job saw God and repented. Job chapter 42, verse 6, Peter cried out, I am a sinful man, when he saw Christ's power in Luke 5, 8. What about the self-righteous rabbi, Saul? He saw that his own righteousness was but a a garbage next to the, the glory of Christ. And he believed and became the apostle Paul. We see these instances when people are are confronted or exposed to the glory of God. And it isn't their their own uh, standing of what they've earned. They are completely floored, paralyzed. Whoa, whoa, I'm not good enough. This isn't for me. I don't belong here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. Because God is so holy. See, his glory takes the stage. And his glory reveals our sin. It reveals what's what's wrong, what has actually separated us from him to begin with. And when believers have a, a true experience with the Lord, it doesn't make them proud. It doesn't make them proud. It humbles and breaks them. I, I've said this oftentimes, but... Uh, you know, in our worship services, when it comes to the musical part, we intentionally sing songs of testimony every week. Every week we sing a, tong- a song of testimony. And the reason that we do that is because I always want us to remember the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Whether we're taking communion, which also does that, baptism is another sign of that, but every song that we sing, the lyrics are important. We are remembering the sacrifice of Jesus and the power that we have because of him. And every single time, every single time that we get to that testimony song and I'm reminded of, I go way back to when I was just 13, 14 years old and I was just a messed up little kid in a broken family in need of a savior and God saved me. And I remember being at that conference or or like a rally or whatever it was. And I remember giving my life to Jesus. And I'm taken back to that moment. I'm taken back. I'm taken back to where it started with me and Jesus. And I remember. It doesn't make me proud. I don't feel like, oh, look at how far I've come. No, I'm taken back to that place. Like, man, I have not forgotten I have not forgotten. God, I am aware that even as a a father and a husband, as a pastor, I am a man of unclean lips in need of your cleansing. So Isaiah is confessing his sin here. He mentions his unclean lips, which is a product of an unclean heart. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it for you, verses 16 through 18. 
It says this, but, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Think of like a veil over their eyes. It says the veil is removed. Now, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes, listen, this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So what he's saying is, we're exposed to this glory and it is changing us. Uh, uh, last year we did a series and, and there was a statement I made where, you know, usually we think, you know, seeing is believing, right? I'll see it, I'll believe it when I see it. You ever heard that? You ever said that? I have a new phrase, seeing is becoming. When you see the glory of the Lord, you cannot stay the same. His glory takes the stage. It takes our full attention. It reveals our current state. It gives us an opportunity, one that will be almost involuntarily, I promise you. It's not going to be like, oh yeah, you know what? I should take care of that. Kind of like that household task that you never do. We're being changed. We're being transformed. That is how you know that your worship is being accepted, that you're doing it right. If you're staying the same, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't get angry with me. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And I would really encourage you. One of the most, the number one thing that stops us from experiencing all that God has for us is our, our unwillingness to confess our sin and repent. You think because nobody knows about it, nobody saw you, that it didn't hurt anybody else. That God's just going to say, oh yeah, I saw that, don't worry about it. No. No. When we're faced with the glory of God, it will be revealed. It will be very clear, and you will have the, no other option but to say, God, I am not worthy. I don't deserve this, and you are absolutely right, and either was Isaiah. He was not worthy. Worship that leads to transformation happens when God's glory reveals our sin, and we respond with repentance. The seraphim comes and cleanses Isaiah with a hot coal from the altar. Uh, this is a transforming moment. He is now uh, clean when he was once unclean. And I was reading, um, I forgot which commentator I was reading, but he was saying uh, how great that there was a throne and an altar. How messed up would it be if, if God's glory from his throne revealed our sin, but there was no altar to go to to make it right? But here in this vision that Isaiah, Isaiah is seeing, uh, the seraphim on fire goes and picks up a coal from the altar and brings it to him and touches his lips and cleanses him. It says, he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then he he. he he said, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me, send me. If you're taking notes, when you're truly worshiping God, when you're truly worshiping God, we are made useful to God. We are made useful to God. Isaiah didn't realize it, but he was actually having a commissioning service right there. <laughs> Ceremony, I mean. God said, who will go for us? Who shall I send? And immediately after receiving this cleansing, Isaiah, uh, his hand goes in the air. Ooh, me, 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 I'll go. Send me. Why? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Because he was grateful. He was grateful and confident of the living God who sits on the throne. And cannot be moved. 
See, there's something that happens in the presence of God. There's something that happens when we are in worship. And I'm not just talking about the musical part of worship, something that might orchestrate your emotions. I'm not talking about that. It's not limited to that. That is, that is a part of worship. But there's something that happens when we are worshiping God truly the way that he said for us to do it. Something is going to happen. It is impossible for it to not happen. See, one of those guys that responded, just like Isaiah did, right? They responded, and that I mentioned earlier, was the Apostle Paul. Now, much of what we have in the New Testament is written by, by him. In the book of Romans, we have probably uh, the greatest summary of Christian theology ever written. Ever written. And as a man who has experienced the same cleansing power of God that Isaiah did, this is what he says in Romans 12, chapter 1 and 2. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. He's not commanding you. He's not demanding you. He's saying, hey, I'm telling you, think about what God has done for you in view of God's mercy. In view of what he did for you when you were 13 years of age and you were lost and in a broken family and how God scooped up and saved you and saved you from the life that you could have really, really messed up. In view of God's mercy, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Your spiritual worship. He goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul's urging, he's urging them, he says, man, in view of what God has done, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, and not just part of you. No, much like a burnt offering of the Old Testament that was completely consumed only for God. He's saying you are that offering, your life. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. This is holy. It is set apart. It is only for God and pleasing. It is acceptable to him. And he calls it spiritual worship. We're talking about accepted worship that always leads to transformation. He says, don't be like the world, but continually be transformed by the renew renewing of your mind. Then, then you will be able to, to test and discern what the will of God is. Think about what he's saying there. Think about the chain of events. First of all, offer yourself all of it. Don't hold anything back. It's only, absolutely, only for God. He's not sharing any of the glory. You offer yourself as a living sacrifice. We do this out of obedience. And because we do that, it is holy and acceptable. And he tells them, don't conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that then you will be able like a key that unlocks the door to what God wants to do with you. See, I believe that. I believe God, he, we have, we, we talked earlier about the Great Commission, right? Go make, baptize, and teach disciples, right? That's everybody's, everybody's mission here. But what does God want to do with you? Are you doing what he wants you to do? Or are you not hearing it because your world is consuming and, and taking uh, the stage when God's glory should be what you're focusing on? See, when we're truly worshiping God, there are things that will happen. And that's the goal. We want God. We want, I want to see uh, what, what it would look like, the metaphor of, of God, a fire falling from the sky and consuming not this external offering, not a song that we sing, but me. Me. 
That's what Paul's getting. You're the sacrifice. But you're not a sacrifice that is going to be killed. You're a living sacrifice. It's no longer this mountain or this temple where, where Jesus is going to, or God's going to be worshipped. You are now that temple. Where the spirit of God lives inside of us. So this morning, the goal is that acceptable worship always leads to transformation, but into what? Into the person of Jesus Christ. That is who where we are being changed. We are being transformed from glory to glory till we look like him. So our worship isn't just music. Our worship isn't just uh, uh, giving some money or tithing or offering. Our worship isn't just those, those maybe tangible things. Our worship isn't just a couple of hours on Sunday. Just like that water that is, is manipulated when introduced to a frequency, there will be an obvious, an obvious difference in us who are the sacrifice that God is accepting. It'll change the way you speak to your spouse. It'll change the way you speak to God and probably how frequent you talk to God and what you say to him. It will change uh, the way that you uh, uh, show up either 10 minutes late for church or 15 minutes early because you don't want to miss the corporate time we have together to experience the presence of God. To have God speak and all of us understand it. It'll change the way you love your kids. It'll change the way you look at your coworker. It'll change the way you drive. I'm still praying for that one, right? <laughs> but it will change us. So as the worship team comes back up, I want to spend some time, some devoted time, to give you the opportunity to respond this is an altar, and what we do here is this is a place where we come to God. We come to God and say, Lord, either I've got it wrong, or Lord, I need your help, or God, thank you. Thank you for being with me. This is the altar where we say, God, I am that sacrifice. I am the one. I am giving of myself. And maybe this morning, maybe this morning you've never done that before. Maybe this morning when I'm talking about being a living sac sacrifice for God, that is a foreign concept to you. But I believe that God wants to change every single one of us. So is the worship that we're giving God acceptable? Is the sacrifice that we're giving him the one he, he requires? This is a time to examine ourselves. This is a time to, not in pride, but in humility beholding the glory of the Lord, beholding his glory, that it is his glory that matters above everything else. And that glory transforms us from one glory to another. It is because of him, it is about him, not about my pride or my fear that I would come to this altar and say, God, God, forgive me. Forgive me if I have not been giving you what you asked of me. What would it look like? What would it look like if God were to accept the sacrifice of you? Would you please stand? Sometimes, sometimes we need to come to the altar. We need to drop our pride. We need to maybe uh, uh, drop that fear. We need to come to the altar because that is where we experience the cleansing power of God. That is where we experience the love of God in some of the most powerful ways. So I don't want you to miss that this morning. So I want to invite you. I'm going to be here. I would love to pray with you as they sing this last song. But let's come before the Lord.